Welcome to Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be the Oklahoma legend, the WWE Hall of Famer, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we've got a two-time Hall of Famer, the only person to go in in successive years, an integral part of two of the greatest factions in wrestling history, a huge part of the Attitude Era on both sides. He was here, he was there, and then he was back. And he's one of the best guys in the business. He's a good friend of ours. Mr. Sean Waltman, X-Pac, thanks for joining us. Oh, man. I've already told you a few times now how honored I am. And, you know, uh, sitting back, feeling left out, watching you guys have, like, Stan Hansen and <laughs> Michael Hay, like, all, you know. Anyways, man, um, it feels good to be in uh, this company. The best part of these shows <laughs> is always trying to get a bunch of old wrestlers that are used to uh, rubbery doll phones yeah. on Zoom. So, yeah. Sean, it has, it has been so much fun doing this, you know, and, and when, when John and I first started, you know, uh, we kind of exchanged lists. You were on our list, but, you know, we know your schedule and we know your, your, you, you know, what you've been doing with yourself and we're so proud of you. But, you know, we figured we, we'd start in chronological order, <laughs> yeah. you know, and start with, we'll start with the Stan Hansen, and he's 2,000 miles away from me, so I could call him an old fart, but I hope I don't have to do an autograph session with him here anytime right. coming up there. But, you know, we, we kind of started like that, but, and about, you were on both of our lists, so it's, it's an honor, and, you know, and I'm just amazed that, you know, the kid that I met when I, he was about 16, 17, 18 years yeah. old, you know, back uh, in the early days there, what you become. And, and, you know, man, you've done it all. But, you know, uh, the trainers you've had, Carl yeah. Gott. Well, it Boris was Boris Malenko. Boris Malenko and, and Eddie. And let's don't forget Eddie Sharkey, man, one of the yeah. greatest trainers in the world. Just uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, so it, I would love for people to think that Carl, Carl actually trained me. It was more Carl's son-in-law, Masami. I didn't. I don't know if you knew Masami Sora. Yeah, I did. I did. But it was. It was more him. And like, obviously, I w I wouldn't wouldn't mind people thinking that Carl trained me because, like, <laughs> uh, for obvious reason. Uh, but he would. You know, he would come. He would come there. Uh, well, you had the Malenko. There, yeah, the Malenko the, who, who was direct from and not on it, not yeah. on Masami, but but um, the Malenko general you know, had worked uh, exclusively with Gotch. Yeah, and um, and and Malenko. <laughs> Man, it was just, I was so blessed, Jerry. So blessed. And, and I didn't have any money. You know, I'm the little skinny ass kid, 15 years old. And, you know, um, he was really, he took me in, man. And, and uh, you know, I tried to do the best I could to, to help work it off. Like I would, I would make the posters and the tickets and help him promote the shows and stuff like that. And I would stay in the ring, Jerry. You guys, I would stay in the ring all day. Like each person, each student would get in and practice their shit on me. So I, I got all the ring time, you know, and that's why my technique was, was sharp or whatever. But like, yeah, man, I, I just, I'm so blessed with, with that kind of training, man. It was incredible. Hey. And when when you came out of that training, uh, was was that when Dusty was was booking here and uh, and Eddie was gone, or was that no. after? No, it was. They, Crockett had already uh, bought, you know, bought Florida, and you know when he was buying up like UWF right. and all that shit, and and uh, and it and they kind of quit doing the TV, and and at that point, Mike and Steve started doing some other independent shows. They were running some stuff at like the Robarts Arena in Sarasota, right. and then um, and then you know, um, uh, what was it? rc rental or R, what was that pwf that that dusty was doing and like he was yeah. working with, he was working with big yeah. steel man on top and right you know like yeah. that and PWF, had, yeah yeah Something and like gordon that. gordon was co doing commentary right. with uh with ddp and all that so that was going on but you know malenko was like you know they had that falling out him and him and eddie graham and so like right like it was you know we were you know weren't part of that and, and, and that, but like a lot of Malenko's guys were working on those shows, right. but no one had me on their show yet. I was just a skinny little kid. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. age were you in your first match? I was 16 when I actually had my first match. I was 15 when I started uh, training with, with, with Larry, with, with Malenko. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was just at some um, little, uh, 
uh, recreation center, like probably a half mile from the Florida State Fairgrounds. Yeah, and how did you end up getting down to Texas? Because you you've been on TV forever. Yeah. You know, people don't realize you were. I guess you were 19 years old. Yeah. You were Global Wrestling Federation with Jerry Lynn and putting on some great matches. You yeah. know, so people just assume that you're as as old as me and Jerry. <laughs> and you're. <actually> not. <laughs> I just, uh, I, well, you came through there too, John. I did. New book, yeah, man. That I was loved a long, it. Loved it there. Yeah, it was amazing, right? Like the it was so cool being a sportatorium. Yeah, the, uh, the, so you're saying, the so you're saying he's an old man too then. <laughs> the, the real yeah. sportatorium, not not yeah. the one in Florida, the real sportatorium. They're on Katie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And, and, um, and that's a toss up there, John. Yeah, those are fight more almost. And you know your record. Hey, John. So yeah, up yeah in, I do. <laughs> up up in Minnesota, like I had left Florida, you know, because you got so Jerry, you know, man, Florida had a ton. There was a glut of talent in Florida. Always, yeah. Right? A ton of that. So yeah. like, and I just and I went to Minnesota and I stood out up there because it was all a bunch of big guys, you know, like the uh, the guys you imagine when you hear, you know like the Eddie Sharkey crew or whatever. Right. Um, and, but I could wrestle better than they could, you know? And um, so I stood out and we had some guys like Jerry Lynn and some other guys up there uh, that I could tell have. Us, tell us a little bit about a firsthand experience from Jerry Lynn. You know, I, I, I never got to work with yeah. Jerry cause he was just, you know, right, right, right after my time as just about everybody was, but I just admired his work and his psychology in the ring. I mean, what what a mentor and what a way to start your career because you were you were you were what yeah. we call a business married to Jerry for a long right. period of time. Yeah. Well, Jerry had Jerry was a Brad Rangan's guy. He was trained by Brad, just like right. just like John. Yep. And um and uh I just man, I connected with him and we just had great chemistry right right away. And and we became best friends and um you know we came up with all these ideas and plans and you know and just and just doing stuff on on our local shows there too and we got a lot of press you know like it was you know um in in the dirt sheets or whatever but just just in general and and joe pedicino he uh he was starting that you know global and uh and he was trying to do something different and you know, he he read the he read the the, the, the dirt newsletters, sheets. the dirt yeah. sheets, yeah, and oh. um, so yeah, I got the call, oh. and it was you know it wasn't like I was uh, getting rich, but man, for me, I was get they put me on a downside guarantee of three hundred dollars a week, whether I worked or not. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was. Man, I've made it. Big money. Of <laughs> course, for somebody that didn't have any money when yeah. you started and, and, and struggled to make it. I mean, Sean, you defy the odds. Somebody your size is not supposed to make it right. in the world of professional wrestling. You yeah. defied every odds that uh, odd that there was on that. Hey, so like I'm gonna tell you what what I did was so Jerry, what made me want to be a wrestler was I knew somebody that worked at the Bayfront Center. So I would go to the Bayfront Center. I would help Gordon Nelson set the ring up. Start wow. when I was start when I was yeah. ten years old. Yeah. I, so I, I would be back around all the boys and everything, and uh, so yeah, man, I fell in love with it from 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 way back then. Well, I you just had, had great influences there, man. Yeah. So where was I? <laughs> we were getting well, we're talking about Jerry and Lynn. Lynn. Not not to not to. Get out of order because we don't. Yeah. We don't follow us. <laughs> we don't follow us. Uh, well, well, let's get out of order. I mean, we don't. We don't. Have and, as all the old wrestlers <laughs> say, we don't follow a script. Yeah. Hey, but that TV time, man. That that, yeah. that that GWF time slot every day after you get home from school if you're a kid, and 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 it's on. And that like it's just like when Kurt Henning told me when I got to WWF, like he's like even if you don't like make a lot of money here, like the the TV exposure is priceless. And he's right. And the same with the GWF stuff. Like that's what people knew who you were, right? Right, John? Absolutely. Yeah. Because it was uh, on that ESPN platform. So you got noticed nationally everywhere. So people just assumed you were a star. You know, people didn't really know the difference. A lot of people didn't, you know, between say the big companies and also this company that's on ESPN because you had film it. You know, we had, we had big crowds in the sportatorium. Mm -hmm. Now, most of them were papered tickets. You know, they had, They'd give away tickets for free, trying to get them on parking and booze. So yeah. but we'd have twenty five hundred people there almost every 
Friday night when we filmed. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hey John, I'm curious what, like, I got a question for you. Which ring was harder, the sportatorium ring or the old WWE ring before they got the new ones? Wow. That's close. Cause the old WWE ring, people don't realize how hard those rings were. They were, I like, call it the billiards table. Oh my God, they were so <laughs> hard. I think what happened was I'd been told, and Jerry might know this, this true story behind it, was when they did Saturday Night's main event and they saw the yeah. ring give, you know, because they had some freaking massive guys. They didn't like it. And so they tightened up the ring. And so now all the rings were freaking you know, like concrete. The problem came was when they would start putting in good rings with the concrete rings. Yeah. Because John, I, John, I, I, John, I'm, I'm, and I'm you know what you had. I'm surprised you knew that story, John, but that's exactly how it happened because we had the, you know, the pre-roll rumble, you know, in one of those rings and we saw that ring sag and those steel posts actually bending in, you know, and after, mm -hmm. after that, we saw our steel ring posts and man, have anybody ever left those, those are two, 300 pounds of solid steel. Yeah. They were actually bent in. So, so Dick Embersall and Lou Del Pratt, you know, the Saturday Night Live guys, Guys, that, that's a set problem. We got to fix that. And that's when our rings become, you know, yeah. immovable objects. Hey, but the, the sportatorium ring was cemented into the ground. Yeah, yeah, it was going so nowhere. hard. And when they sold the building, they had to cut those things out of there. I wanted oh, to go saw, down and make a bid on those things. You're talking about the Tampa sportatorium, Jerry, but it, the, the, the Dallas oh. sportatorium's ring was cemented into the ground too also wow <laughs> hard as a rock i remember when uh one of the crews came through either wc i think wcw that's when i think jake roberts somebody pulled up that when the shot they it. shot yeah, to, yeah. Shot it. they're gonna, like we'd rather get shot than have to bump in this <laughs> ring the ring was freaking concrete <laughs> yeah you know and the problem was when wb first started giving good rings that you didn't know which ring you had until you got right. out there exactly you couldn't, you couldn't plan a match because you're not going to take a bump off the mid rope if it was that yeah. old ring. It, it but was, if you saw Kyoto, a little secret on that, if you saw Kyoto, you knew he was going to have the good ring. The good one? Mm. Yeah. I yeah, wish that's you could that. us up to that, Jerry. Hey, so when I came, <laughs> hey, hey, you guys, when I came back to, to uh, from, from WCW, uh, to, 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 you know, do DX, you know, my big return or whatever, uh, like the, the whole negotiation, one of, the, one of JR's big negotiating selling points to me was we're getting new rings that was actually a selling <laughs> that was point. it yeah. wow <laughs> well that was one of the problems because we we couldn't the guy our guys couldn't do big bumps because yeah. oh don't tell me you would have done a bigger bump lay field if they're a bit better ring. come on now i know you <laughs> <laughs> you better believe it i'm hey, not john, a bigger bump yeah john you weren't you weren't afraid to bend the knee <laughs> no 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 you, well, I, you, you took your share I had no he was problem. old. He was old school, man. He come up in that Texas that old school era there, yeah. man. Uh, he had to take a bump, <laughs> or they would take your ass down. It was funny because Skandor Akbar, I rode with Ak. You know, I got to ride with Ak and Killer Tim Brooks and Murdoch and the guys. Wow. And such a that was one. And James Beard, some some great guys. But Ak used to always talk about Harley Race. He goes, he was the only one tough enough to bump in the keel in St. Louis. <laughs> Is it that bad the keel? Oh like, man, like, was it ever? I can experience that. I I I, I got uh, body slam and a big squash by. Uh, oh man, I can't even think. Maybe one of those big four hundred and fifty pounder guys that they had in St. Louis. And I was about I was about a, a two two oh five two ten. I and I've never felt it. And it, plus, Sean, it was a twenty two foot or so. You know, I was going to say throw, I heard it was like twenty five feet yeah, or something. Yeah, like they that. throw you into the turnbuckles. I mean, it <laughs> took a day to get there. You know, and there was not a lot of crisscrossing in right. the matches. A lot of stuff was done right in the center because you <laughs> step out of that center and it was like stepping on the cement. So yeah, Harley Harley was a badass. He was no, he was a bumper in St. Louis. So hey, John, man, you know. You brought up you brought up Akbar like not enough gets said about him and what a great guy he was and, and so helpful to the younger guys. He was fabulous. You know, they talk about the great managers. You know, there in uh, Texas, I always mentioned Gary Hart. Akbar was ever bit as part of the foundation yeah. in Texas and ever. He was one of the first guys to bench press five hundred pounds back in the fifties. Right. Yeah, and he is a big barrel chested dude. Yeah. I mean, he, yeah. he knew how to get heat and he loved to help guys. Yep. You know, he'd take you with you and he'd start explaining to you, you know, his big thing was he never watched a match that that often, at least later in his uh, career, 
and then come back and say, how was it? He goes, sounded great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all like, and it's true. Yeah. You could tell almost everything you need to know without even having to watch. But well, then we tell we tell that story we had Mike McGurk on Sean that Leroy McGurk wow. used to do color commentary totally blind, but he could do it by the sound of the ring. You know, that's crazy. And that, that's what you guys are saying. You know, it's it's uh, Akbar. He could he had that Leroy McGurk training. That's where he broke in, yeah. and he he learned to listen to the matches like Leroy did, and you could tell 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 what was going on. Wow. You know, Act what well, story that I told Sean a lot of people didn't know was Act the reason he served in the army is he grew up in Wichita Falls and they picked on him because he was first generation Lebanese. So he told one of the guys one day, he goes, the guy wanted to fight him. Act goes, okay. And they rode out in the country together. Act broke both of his legs. Both of his legs. He, he showed me how yeah. he did it, put it in figure four and snapped his leg. You know, he was strong as he could be. Yeah. And he drove the guy to the hospital. <laughs> and the sheriff came and told Act, he goes, listen. I know it was a fair fight. They want to hang you, basically. He oh, goes, Jesus. if you'll join the army, I don't have to prosecute you. Because I, I know the sheriff did him a solid. And that's how I ended up joining the army and came back and then started in professional wrestling. Wow. But hey, Ack, man. Ack was legit. He was a tough guy. Yeah, oh, yeah. Hey, hey, John. Um, Jesus Christ, whose show is this? It's, I'm asking you. <laughs> but, hey, but uh, you bring, uh, we but, love it. Boy, this, ain't no, we, we, this is how what we do, Sean. We, uh, just jump in there. <laughs> it's just, man, you just, and you mentioned Tim Brooks, and I never got to be around Tim <laughs> Brooks, man. And I got, like, just, like, you, you would see the pictures in the magazines and a little bit on TV. But, like, I've gone back and watched some stuff recently on Tim oh. Brooks. And, man, he was great. Oh, he was a great heel. I mean, a great heel. Booker T will tell you the same thing. He wrestled me and Booker T a bunch. And we wrestled one night. Uh, we had a match there on television. And, I mean, you could have drawn a five-foot circle around us. It was a potato fest. I mean, just <laughs> it be. And when he came back, he goes, kid, we did it on television. Now we don't have to do it on every house show in the country. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, so right? we work. and then Killer could work, but he was he could work snug, too. But he got heat like no one I've ever seen. Yeah. Brooks is one of those uh, well-kept secrets, you know, that, that should be out there and should, should everybody should be talking about Keller Brooks because John just said the secret. He was a heat-seeking missile, and he knew how to build that heat so well in a ring. I mean, and, uh, and that, that, that was Keller's forte, you know, was getting that heat. If you worked with him, man, you knew you were going to hear that white heat. Nice. Yeah, man, and like so everyone wants to work with you, right? Yeah. Right. When Killer came to the ring, it was just a different feel. I mean, a complete different feel. The crowd felt different. People felt like the, somebody was going to get hurt. I mean, Killer really yeah. knew how to work a crowd and get heat. He was, I don't know, underrated because everybody that worked with him knew mm -hmm. how great he was. But yeah. I think underrated in history because not that many people knew him because he, he never worked a major promotion, I guess. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Like, he, like I, I see him in Georgia and then, you know, in Texas. And honestly, that's the only yeah. place I ever saw him pop up. You know, when I was a kid, I'd ride yeah. with him and act uh, and James Beard and Killer would always love to smoke a, a little weed. Yeah, and, and he would never <laughs> do it. He'd never do it in the car, and he'd never do it around us. So we'd go into like a Seven Eleven on the way to the show. Killer goes, ah, I'm gonna go around back to the bathroom. There's no bathroom <laughs> back there. <laughs> Killer go out smelling like weed. <laughs> like, yeah, I was ready to go, but he would never do it in front of us. Yeah, it's and it's yeah. like, you know, I, I'm sure if you're listening or watching this show, you're probably you know, old enough to know that, like, you know, it used, it wasn't as, it wasn't as cool. It wasn't as okay to get caught in the weed back then. Yeah, that's uh, right. Guys, yeah. guys kind of kept that under wraps. Guys would drink. Yeah. That was, that was pretty Yeah. Cool. You had to be very select on who you had as your, your road partner right. back in those days. I mean, you didn't want it because you know, the, Guys would would leave in two weeks, you know. Hey, I rode with the Briscoes, man. And, you know, it's like a, they were sending smoke signals in Oklahoma. <laughs> and then the stories get blown out, and the next thing you know, yeah. it's like this big tall tale. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. The the biggest heat I ever had with Pat Patterson. You know, I love Pat Patterson. We all love Pat because he was so yeah. much in and every one of our careers. You know, I mean, he, at WWE's existence, Pat Patterson was was a part of it. But when we were coming back from uh, West Palm Beach, Sean, and you know the road down there, you get on that Highway 60, man, there's nothing to do. You got to entertain yourself out there. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. Wrestlers and truckers were the only ones on the road, plus a few rattlesnakes and alligators. So yeah. uh, we got to go through that little town. Uh, uh, 
uh, Lake Wells, and there was oh, yeah, a Lake Wells. Little, little Marty fight type town, and, and, and a sheriff's deputy there that loved wrestling. So he saw Pat come in. Pat just bought him a new Lincoln Continental, so he knew I'd be a wrestler because he got figured out the schedule. And so he pulled Pat over, and the cop was just going there. And Pat said, Hey, you, you like the Briscoe Brothers? Oh, man, the Briscoe Brothers, they're my favorite ones. You know, I grew oh, up here Jesus. in Florida. Well, they're right behind me. The next car so he let pat go so we're passing through this little lake wells all of a sudden these blue lights come on we're rolling down everyone in the car we put the moon roof down it must have looked like a damn uh, forest car you know coming up. and this cop don't get out of his car and walk to the car he gets out of his car and sprints up there Oh, Jesus. Let's go, brothers and we're thinking oh man there's mike Rotundo in the back along with el grand apollo we're all thinking, man, we're going to jail. Eddie Graham's going to fire every one of us. Oh, man, I've been wanting to stop you guys forever. Can I have your autograph? <laughs> sure, man. So I don't think I'm, boom, we're out of town. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> Pat. Yeah. When, Mark, when and the I'm next, next, next morning at TV, uh, we nearly killed Patterson. You know, Pat. Oh, I bet. <laughs> when's I that, bet. Mark? We're in Florida. And I know my good friend Charles Wright, Godfather, won't mind me telling the story because I think he's told it himself many times. I would. I would never tell anything to embarrass him or anything, but I don't think he doesn't mind. So him and Vistra are pulled over and stopped by the police. So yeah. me and Ron realize, oh, geez, man, they may have something on them. So we pull up and we're going to try to run the distraction and get them out of there. It's, it's like three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Oh. So the, the, when Godfather gets out, <laughs> they, they, they've been enjoying, they've been enjoying the afternoon. Right. Right? And so he comes out, he goes, hey, man, uh, the police officer recognized us driving down the road, pulled over and wanted to get an autograph. So there's a drug dog in the back of the police officer's car. So when, when he stopped the Godfather <laughs> and Viscera, the dog is going, ho! <laughs> <laughs> like, like, dude. Let <laughs> and the cop says, Oh, he's a big, big fan of you, too. He <laughs> right. And I'm like, Guys, please uh, go. Please go. Hey, I've been, I've, I've been on a trip or two uh, in the same car with, with Charles and Viscera. So oh. I know what goes on in that car. Oh, my goodness. He almost had to check into a secondhand smoke clinic ride with yeah. Eddie and Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> We'd pull over Bob Evans. We'd get like uh, we'd get like cakes and pies. They get chicken breasts and water. <laughs> I used to be like Charles. At, at some point, this is like wasting the weed. Like <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> oh my god! Hey, buddy, at what point I, is that? One thing I always thought when when I, I was going to think about you today was you know watching some old stuff. Uh, the Freebirds. You know, you, I think they're probably the two greatest. Four greatest factions of all time, my opinion, would be NWO, DX, uh, the the Four Horsemen, and the Freebirds. You know, yeah. New, Day, New Day might be in that talk, you know, a few years from now, but I'm going to exclude yep. anybody today. But, you know, I think those four are pretty safe for the Mount Rushmore. I always thought Buddy Roberts was one of the most valuable players for the Freebirds. Yeah. So just a heat-getting little son of a bitch. Yeah. I always thought your role was kind of the same. I, it was. They could get massive heat. Yeah. And you got to have that guy in your group. I mean, Buddy Roberts made the Freebirds. I always thought you helped make just as much as everybody else or more, you know, whatever you want to say, those groups because you were that heat getting well, well with Buddy Roberts. Well, and thank you for recognizing that, John, because that's by design. Uh, that was on purpose. I was the Buddy Roberts of the Wolf Pack. The Wolf Pack was like the Freebirds. We were real, like, we were. Like even we did the Freebirds rules. We called it Wolfpack rules. Like if one like yeah. Scott and Kev were the tag champs. Kev was hurt, so I defend it with Scott and you know things like that. And yeah, man, we were just we we were like the Freebirds, and we weren't afraid to admit it either. We were mar Freebird marks, regardless of whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was very summer. You had a, you had a guy that could talk. You had the guy that could work. You had the guy that could yeah. get heat. I mean, it was very, oh, yeah. very similar in, in uh, many respects. Yeah, Buddy Roberts is just like the unsung hero, man. And uh, yeah, um, that's I, who I, I that's what I battered myself after. I like to think I knew my role, you know, I, and I was happy in my role. 
Yeah. You know? Sean, Sean, I think that's one of the reasons why you were so successful and and everything you did. You you understood the psychology of it, and I don't know if it was that Malenko training and that those early days you had because they they taught that a lot. But you understood the role of either a baby face or a heel. You you understood when you were a baby face, you were the underdog. And you understood that size difference. And there was no ego in you in size. The only ego you had was in the quality of exactly. your work to be yeah. the best. And so yeah. I think that's really, when you understand that psychology of our business, big guy, little guy, then you're going to be successful. But, but when you go, hey, I'm a little guy, but I'm going you know, I'm, I'm to be a big guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I see, I see guys doing that these days. And I understand what they're trying to do, but it's not. It's, they're shooting themselves in the foot. You know, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm proud of like the, the, uh, the, the way I kind of my method of, of having the big man, little man match. And, and, and man, I just loved it. It was my favorite thing to do. Like it, it hurt my body more, you right. know, than having a match with like somebody like, you know, another like quote unquote cruiserweight or something like that. Like I wasn't a big, like I'd rather work with the big heavyweights. First right. of all, it paid more money, and I just I thought the matches were more compelling, and I love Eddie, 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 Eddie Graham's philosophy with me uh, is you know because uh, Jack was heavyweight champion of the world, and back in those days, you know you didn't dare put brother against brother. So I was I always bitched Eddie, you know I'd like to be junior heavyweight, and he said you don't want ever want to classify yourself as a junior heavyweight. Promoters will start saying you're a junior heavyweight. And then you're going to mm -hmm. be in that role. If you want to make money, you got, yeah. you got to work. You got to be a heavyweight. <laughs> yeah. That's why I fought it. And not, not in WCW because they did a pretty good job with their cruiser weights down there. Yeah, I did but it, just was, job, yeah. it just wasn't a thing for Vince. And like when they decided to put the cruiser weight and the light heavyweight stuff, like I, I didn't want to do it. You know, I, I just didn't want to do it because I know where that figured in in right. the card in, in WWE. It's just that's just the way it was, well, you know. Me and, and, me and Ron got you know to work with all the great tag teams of the night. I mean, that was one of the greatest eras of tag team his, you know in history. You know, one of not maybe not the best, but one of. We always loved working with you and Kane, and I've seen uh, I loved every, it with you guys every oh. single interview. You had the ability to make a match and understand size difference. You never once shot me or Ron off. Never. You know, it was just, it was just, it was such a great dynamic uh, working with you guys because of the way that your ability to be able to work with a huge partner against two really big guys. And, and I, something about me, like I really like, and maybe some guys don't as much, but I really like the physicality of it, John. And we would get physical in there, right? Like, oh, yeah. And, and dude, I'm sure I, I'm sure I lit you up a few times. Like, yeah. I never heard anything about it from you, but like, it, like I got into that, man. Yeah. Like, it made, like, I get, like, I get a little bit goosebumps just thinking about it right now. <laughs> you, know, you know, we, and the good part was we, we liked to work with each other. There wasn't an ego. There, there was the match that we dropped the, the titles to you. I just looked up to make in sure Chicago. I just looked up to make sure I was right about this because as you get older, you conflate matches and stories and yeah. towns and get stuff wrong. And people on the internet say, oh, that wasn't, a, that was hair. But I remember we're talking backstage and they wanted us to slip on a banana peel. And Ron said, why would you do that? And he said, basically, what do you want to do? He goes, just have him beat me. And you know, because, I remember it. Because yeah. Ron was the bigger name, it meant more to beat Ron. Yeah. And so they wanted, Ron said, why don't you have Pac beat me? And they said, how do you want to do it? He goes, with his finish. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it was perfect. But that was Ron's call because Ron, Ron yeah. knew he was the bigger name. He knew that him, him getting beat was much better. And him getting beat right in the middle of the ring was much better for you guys than it was by slipping on some banana peel and kicking out on two and three quarters. And, 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 and Kane grabbed you and, and grabbed your foot and pulled you out right as the finish That's was right, happening. Yeah. Right. And it was just a simple round goes for his, I slide behind him, hit him with mine. And yeah, it was perfect. But yeah, man, yeah, I love so working with you guys. You know, guys overthink it sometimes. It's, mm. it's, it's not that hard, you know, you... <laughs> dude, I remember like not to get too far off into the weeds, but like Ron is the most explosively powerful man I've ever been in the <laughs> ring with. Yeah. Like, yeah, there's Mark, Mark Henry, World's Strongest Man, but uh, like the explosiveness yeah. uh, of Ron, like, and man, like I used to love it when he would do that FU slam to that one-handed slam where yeah. 
Yeah. When he did, man, he picked Matt Bloom up over his head with one arm wow. like that. I couldn't believe it. Uh, Sean, we had uh, Lex Luger on not long ago, and Lex actually played college ball against Ron, and he said their their defensive lineman up li- at uh, or their offensive lineman at Miami when they played Florida State was in fear the entire week and trained <laughs> the, the coaching week, uh, the coaching staff, and the training department trained this kid all week to try to try to just negate some of Ron's power. Wow. Yeah, man. When Barry Switzer played against the University of uh, Florida State University, they said, hey, how are you going to beat uh, the Seminoles? And he goes, got to figure out how to block Ron Simmons. And that, that was it. That was his whole game plan was we got to figure out how to block Ron Simmons. I never seen a pop like when we, we did TV raw or something up there. And, and uh, I remember like Tallahassee yep. and the place was going nuts, man. Like, it was the biggest pop of the, of the whole yeah. night, and we had all, we had everyone there. We had all our biggest hitters on that. Yeah, show. And, yeah. and the place went ballistic. Yeah. I've never yeah. heard a pop <laughs> to this day bigger than Ron Simmons walking out in Tallahassee. Yeah. And the whole oh. stadium was doing the tomahawk chop. I mean, yeah. it, it was incredible. Yeah, there were moments like that, you know, that we remember. But that that was definitely a, a great moment, and, and a great moment, Sean. When you were, we were talking about you and Kane. One of the great moments that you taught Kane how to communicate, you opened the door to Kane to become mayor of Knox County, Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, must have been, it must have been so much fun teaming with, with Glenn because he's such a, a great man. He was the best, like, okay, obviously DX and like all the partners like that people think of, but um, he was my favorite because like we got to do some really cool stuff, like the dynamic, the, you know, our relationship. And just uh, and just not your not your typical bookend tag team, uh, you know the opposite of it, right? Like, right, right. And it just and it was just really neat some of the stuff we got to do and and explore and um, and it was the same night that that John was just talking about that right after we won the the, the belts from them is when we had Kane talk, and that was back then, man. We like. Honestly, like nothing was scripted. We kind of no. had an idea what I was going to say, but like, you know, I just went out there and I just kind of said whatever came to my mind. Like, I mean, it was. It and worked. those interviews stand the test of time. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny, Sean, to watch the guys now, you know, the old guys like us go back. Cause not to say that one generation is better than the other, you know, our generation couldn't read scripts because we, we never did it. This generation is not as good as ad lib. There are some guys that can, but for the most part, they're not good. But to see a bunch of old wrestlers get scripts, they'll sit there and just try to memorize it. What's this? Yeah. Well, well, you know, we, we still get them confused with the drugstore scripts. That's the only kind of script they old they'll <laughs> <laughs> It's just the worst. Oh, Jesus. How crazy was the attitude error? I mean, it was it was doing stuff that was insane. And yeah. Out there, and it was just—it was just carte blanche. Just right? talking about the on on TV, what the people on saw TV, on TV, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, insane everywhere, but it was yeah, but television. But to, the same man, you know what segment got like a lot of people didn't like, but man, it was just so off the wall that I loved it. Was the Mark Henry like May Young that giving birth to the hand? I don't know why I like that so much. <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was great. You know, guys talk about uh, being edgy now, you know, breaking the, you know, the fourth wall, yeah. or whatever you want to call it. But when you walked out as Mark Henry with Mizark in Carney, Oof. you know, that was just, <laughs> that was just like an insider joke to the boys, you know, and the guys <sighs> I see wrestling now, a lot of times they try to do some insider stuff, you know, to kind of get to the internet crowd. We were doing it back then. And I'm not sure trying to get to the hardcore crowd. It was just to pop each other. Yeah. It was just for each yeah. other. Like, yeah, you know, our and- entertainment. I remember Lawler, but like, it got a pop out of Lawler when he saw it. So, <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first time I did commentary, I go down, I sent my Jerry Lawler and, and JR, and JR had these copious notes. I mean, everywhere. He had note yeah. after note after note, and Lawler is drawing somebody in the front row. And that's, <laughs> that's all he's got. Well, Jerry, Lawler doesn't even know the show. <laughs> but it didn't he didn't matter. need to, right? No. Lawler's Lawler. He's, incredibly hey, were you there like do you know he when they had that faker taker thing do you know he drew all the tattoos all undertaker's yes, tattoos on, yeah, right. that's yeah. crazy man yeah, yeah that guy's really brilliant 
Unbelievable. Yeah, they're incredible artists. Uh, I, unless Thatcher and I started the first T-shirt company, and we we had the Briscoe Booster show, uh, shirt and a, a T-Boat uh, uh, T-shirt. So we uh-huh. needed artwork, and I didn't know anybody could do the artwork. Les Thatcher picked up the phone. Now, this is in 1972, 73, called Jerry, and, and Jerry sent us the artwork for, for the first T-shirt. And I, I wish I still had those hardcore, you know, prints that, that he drew up back in those days there. But he was a talented man. Brilliant. Just brilliant, like, in general, right? Like, to be able to, right. to be brilliant at something like that and just also be... You know, so people, brilliant, like, people man. laugh a lot about it. it, it it's territory there, but Memphis was one of those independent territories that you know, always saw a good talent go in and out to work with Lawler. Lawler was smart enough and, and, you know, knew the business well enough to come in, you know, as a total, total fan was what yeah. Jerry was when he got in the business, but he knew he had a plan what he wanted to do. And he brought everybody in and he filled that mid South Coliseum up all the time. Yeah. And he could like, he wasn't like uh, your typical athlete, but man, he was tough. Jerry. Like, like I remember watching him get uh, like Joe LaDuke throwing him like outside the ring onto this table on the floor. And like he literally like s- split his, his quadricep. Like, in ha- like he, he cut like to the bone. Like he, just, I mean, I used to like, I, I know people used to say they used to just tee off on him and he would, just, he wouldn't never complain about got right. about getting potato, nothing like that. So. Yeah, that was Lawler. Lawler never, never complained about nothing. I mean, nothing, you know, nothing bothered him, nothing. <laughs> he still, he had a oh. casket match two weeks ago with Enzo. He still he had the matches. I, two <laughs> years ago, you guys, like, no, it's been more than two years ago. I had a match with him at the halftime of a Memphis Grizzlies basketball game, the ring was suspended about 150 feet above the, the, the arena floor. And I was scared shit the whole time because like, I thought I was going to fall off the edge of, of the ring. Like anyways, but we had this match and it was like, it was just a normal Jerry Lawler match and he still does it. It's I incredible. Think, I think Lawler would wrestle every single weekend right now. If he oh. could, I make fun of him, you know, for being all, he's, he's not that much old. You know, he would wrestle. He loves wrestling. I mean, loves. Yeah. It. yeah. Did you ever work with him, John? No, only 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 on commentary. I don't think I was ever. I may have been in a six man tag with him uh, at WWE, but I never worked with him in Memphis. He was already gone at that point. And I've worked he, with him never, in a hot program in Memphis, and I've never seen anybody over in a town like that guy was yeah. over there. Uh, he worked with my brother. I, I helped set up the match for the for the NWA Heavyweight Championship. They bring a little brother in first yeah. and Lawler to go through me. So we had like a four or five week program leading up to Jack and uh, Jack and uh, the King. And then when they were finished, we uh, uh, Jerry and I come back in the, in the next week there. But he was so over. He could do no wrong there. And uh, Jerry, Jerry, uh, his promo for Memphis just fit to a T because he yeah. was one of them. He is one of them. He loves Memphis. And uh, I think that's what made Jerry so hot there because he was a hometown hero that made it big on TV. And he was on TV every damn Monday night at a positive thing. He must have the greatest library in the world of him beating every damn superstar. <laughs> every big business. name in the business. <laughs> <laughs> that was Jerry Gimmick, you know, come in and beat, you know, the Bachwinkle, the, the Ganya, the, the Briscoe, you know. Uh, the Road Waller Warriors. The Giant, yeah. A Road Warrior. You can go down the list. Waller has a video of him winning. <laughs> Wow. But Jerry, how bad did WWE get him back? He finally gets to WWE and he gets his WrestleMania match against Michael Cole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was beautiful. Hey, Jerry came to Jerry came to Florida though. Like out like, you know, he didn't go leave Memphis much, but like I seen him in Hawaii a couple of times. But like he came in Florida. I was watching this match about a month ago. It was him and Mike Graham from the from the armory. It might have been the armory or the Bayfront Center. Him and Mike Graham were a team. And the people yeah. are going ape shit for him, Jerry. Like he was over, yeah. like wherever he went. He was over. He yeah. was over. Jerry, Jerry, would you miss you on know, like a lot of other guys? Florida you know, was was the vacation spot, of course. And uh, guys from all 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 around the country. If you if you came into Florida, grab his Eddie would book you and he grab a shot in Florida. And uh and Jerry would come down once a year and he would get over on our TV. Yeah. We always had a little method, you know, send two or three weeks of TV in. 
boom, and Eddie would put him right in the middle of the card, and uh, and the people bought him every time he came down. He was a star. You know, TV Guide had a, a deal a few years ago. They said top 25 moments in television history, and one of them was Jerry Lawler and Andy Kaufman on The Tonight Show. Still, yeah. I mean, Jerry yeah. Jerry was, you know, people now, he, they know he's funny. They know he's, you know, he's the modern-day, you know, version of Bobby Heenan. Uh, but people don't realize how he was a massive star. Yeah. And just, like, uh, um, oh, Jesus, I just had a huge brain fart. <laughs> <Never>. <laughs> Sorry. But the whole thing with Andy Kaufman, I mean, that was made because of uh, Jerry. You know, Andy Kaufman was extremely talented, don't get me wrong, but that was the whole thing was made because you had the perfect baby face to go with this little bitty whiny heel. And New York passed on that, right? Ben Sr. passed on that? That's doing the story, that? yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. And apparently it wasn't going to happen, and uh, Letterman was going to go to commercial, and Kaufman called the ad lib and did the whole thing. And it was taped. It wasn't live. So Letterman had the option of not showing it later and they didn't think they would show it. And then they showed the whole thing unedited. They just bleeped out all of Kaufman's language and it became this biggest angle in, in wrestling. And I wonder why Letterman got so upset if he had that right. Cause he, he refused after that to have any type of wrestler on, right? That's well, right. Yeah. I, was it like, I know he had killer Kowalski on one time, but that might've been before the Lawler thing. When they did the remake movie with Jim Carrey, they had yeah. extra, they had extra security there when they did Lawler scene. Like, <laughs> like, gonna, like well, I mean, like he's going to go crazy and start beating up the camera person. Like Jerry says that like uh, Jim Carrey was really, really wacky to deal with at that time. Like he was like getting really like immersed in the Andy Kaufman, you know, persona yeah, he, or whatever. You know, Jerry. He had, to, from what Jerry said, he had to be picked up in like an Andy Kaufman, like whatever car he drove. Yeah, he was a real <laughs> method actor. <Wow. laughs> whatever. <laughs> hey, Jer Jerry. Hey, Jerry. Hey, man. We were just talking about uh, cruiserweight, light heavyweight, junior right. heavyweight stuff. Right. Like, and, you know, trying not to get, you know, like pigeonholed into that. But, man, one of the greatest wrestling, mat pro wrestling matches I ever seen was from the Bayfront with you and Danny Hodge. Man, did you oh, ever see that, John? I haven't, no. Oh, my God. I, I'd love to see it. I, in fact, I'll, I'll get it, I'll get it, and I'll put it on your playlist on our YouTube channel, there, and I'll watch it today. Oh. I tell you what, what's the introduction of it? I, I mean, I'm standing there, you know, I, I, had, I had a decent, I would know Danny Hyde, but, you know, Gordon Soley, as, oh, as only Gordon Soley can do. Ladies and gentlemen, in this corner, yeah. of whatever champion I was, you know, blah, 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 All-American Oklahoma State, blah, 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 Jerry Bristol. And then this corner, two-time Olympian, three-time yeah. national champion, two-time outstanding wrestler, the holder of the record of the most falls, the fastest falls. I mean, you know, 15 minutes of introduction. I'm yep. saying, holy shit, what am I doing here? Wow. <laughs> but Hodge hey. gave me a match, and, and it was a simple finish. You know, wear a plane span, and I got dead, and he rode through. You know, but one, like, two, all, like, like from the get-go, like just <clears> – <throat> You guys just uh, trade going back and forth. It, it, like, it honestly looked like you were really testing each other out in there. Well, I'll tell you something about Hod, and I, I, you know, a lot of people laugh about this, but, you know, I, I, we, we went to, because they're, they're not showing the match in the entirety. I, we, sometimes I, I worked with Danny one time up in Savannah, Georgia, and I actually think he had flashbacks because he went to the University of Oklahoma and I went to Oklahoma State University. I think he had would have flashbacks, and Jack told me the same thing, that sometimes you just had to reach down and give Danny the old office, you know. Office. Danny, yeah. we're working, you know, we're uh -huh. losing up. And that's how that entire match was at the Bayfront Center. And I think that's the reason it was, it was pretty decent. You know? Oh, yeah. Legend has it that uh, Hanson and Brody had a safe word for Hodge. I think it was Bluebird. Uh, that <laughs> if, if, if Hodge got in there and was tying one of them up, the other one had to, the, would yell out, I think, I think it was Bluebird. Come and make the, the save. One, the other one come piling in. <laughs> so when, when freaking Brody and Hanson have to make a safe word. <laughs> for a guy yeah right wow. that, guy, that guy's a badass <laughs> that's respect right there that's wow. for sure hey, sean when did you uh when you when you got the wwe did they have the whole thing planned out for you and razor with the one two three kid from the beginning or did, did it form after you came no well i mean it it, it came after my tryout you know like right uh, like a couple like 
I don't know, maybe about three weeks after my tryout, Vince called me just long enough to where I was wondering if I was ever going to get the call. And then Vince called me and he ran the whole thing by me, you guys. Like, and Pat was on the line too. And like, just how it all played out. That's how they, that's how he laid it out for me. Like it was, and, and I had, I had to go uh, do super junior tournament, new Japan. I still had that commitment. So after I got the big win, then I was gone. And like, so we had six weeks in between. Uh, so that was the only part that was a little different than how he laid it out to me because the, the rematch didn't happen for several more weeks, but it made it better. Like the, him taunt me for an extra, you know, extra few weeks. So, yeah, man, that was all. Um, and it was, it was not just to introduce me, you guys, it was to turn Scott baby face. It was to turn razor baby face and it worked two birds with one stone. Wow. Yeah. What a terrific! And that was that was one of the best storylines WWE ever. Everybody right. remembers that. Yeah, yeah everybody yeah. still talks about it today. It's the great. It's like I can't think of a better way to be introduced because like ninety nine point nine percent of talent that gets introduced come in, get some vignettes, get some squash matches, yeah. you know. And man, so the way did that you go to, did you go to it Japan? was a brand. It was a brand new show at that time too. Yeah. So I mean, it, it helped build the show and it helped build you guys. Yeah. Did you go to Japan after the, the you did the squash job for Scott, or after you went over with the the moon salt? Well, I did the squat. Like, okay, so I had a match with Matt Bourne as Doink, where he just just ran through me. Then one with Curtis Hughes. I, I might have the order mixed up, but it was two basically, you know, uh, squash matches. So people like had two weeks where they see me get my ass beat. And, and then, then you went to Japan and came back and did that. No, no. Then like I come back the next week, I have the match with Scott. I, I get the big win. It okay. was on the tape. It was on a tape show. Um, was it the tapes? Yeah. Um, and, and that's when I left. I left right after that. Right. Yeah. Cause that's when I saw you. That's when I was with you in Japan. No, was it or was it not? No, I, I, I was a couple years later because um, Vince actually, I asked Vince if I could go to Japan for Tenru because I missed Japan. Right. And so he, he lent me to, uh, to Tenru. And I just started to work for uh, yeah. Tenru. And Yoko was there. That's when uh, Jericho was there too, right? It was in yep. the junior heavyweight tournament. Yep. I remember seeing uh, Jericho there and, and thinking if this young guy can live, He's going to be good. Uh, uh, Those guys, the junior heavyweights, then the, the, the you guys you were with, they were unbelievable what they did. Yeah. Yeah, man. I had a hard time keeping up when I went over there for that one. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not afraid to admit it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you, you had, did, how, what, what were your friends saying to you when you, when you did like the, the two squash matches back to back? I mean, was it, <laughs> was it hard to hold it in that, by the way, in a week uh -huh. from now, when this airs, your view of me is going to change dramatically. I got to be honest with you. I don't know if I really did that great of a job of holding it. In. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember, but it wouldn't surprise me if I couldn't keep it under wraps. At least I don't know people. how you could. That was such a big deal. Yeah. Uh, you had, had to share it. Yeah. Wow. So, um, but I know that was the most important like moment of my career. Like nothing else even comes close. And there's been some important moments, but that was like that set the tone for everything. So, so what was happening with uh, you know because we were in the dressing room back then. I came in in '95, and we we've, we've talked about this. We had Phineas Godwin on you know uh -huh. a month ago. We talked about the division in the dressing room. People said there was so much heat between the Click and the BSK. There wasn't yeah. any heat. None at all. There was. <laughs> Guys got along great. That that is that's revisionist history from people on the outside talking about. Yeah, that. yeah. It was like it. Those little things, kind of the, those other offshoots of BSK. Like, like it was kind of like a. I mean, it wasn't a joke, but it was. You know, it wasn't like oh, we're you know these are our colors and you right. know whatever. No, we all got along great. Shit. I mean. Yeah, no, Dennis is right. Wait, there was no heat with any of I, us. I remember because people ask me all the time, you know, say, oh, how much heat was there in the draft? There, Zero. There wasn't any. <laughs> you know, we weren't making any money at that time uh, right. just because business was so bad. Neither was WCW. But that there was no heat between the boys. Right. Yeah, no, I don't. Like, there, what was what was the, the, the – now, during that time, you were 
were you also talking with Scott and Kevin about jumping to WCW? I mean, did you have that guys, did, was, were you in on the planning? Uh, I was the one that got the ball rolling actually, John, like, um, uh, I told, I told the story, but, um, yeah. I'll give you a clip notes version. I was out, out here in LA. I was kind of recouping from injury. I was training with, with Frankie Pettit, with Francois. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Like, cause Francois was, in, was a great martial artist. And, and, um, and so like I was training out here with him and doing some conditioning stuff and staying with Rich Menzer and I, and I, sure. so the gold's gym guy. Yeah. And so like Rich looked me up with Barry Bloom to meet with Barry about doing some movies. But then when I got to, to Barry's office, he told me about WCW and, you know, and we had had a little, I'm like, you know, none of us had ever thought about leaving, but man, when you start hearing about that kind of money, John, and like less yeah. days and all that, man, it's hard not to take that serious. So I called right. Scott right away. Like, man, I was just, it just seemed like the thing to do. Like, I hate to say it, you know, but, um, and it was the right thing to do at the time for us yeah we weren't on guarantees no the downside guarantee that people talk about all the time you know 10 matches a year at 150 bucks a year but you, and, and business and business was way down so nobody was making making any money at that time yeah. either so that's what another thing you had to consider was 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 actually what what you, you were making and 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 we we were in we were in serious trouble at that point yeah yeah it was hard man john you you, you probably remember like if we did a uh, certain parts of Canada are, are like Florida was tough at the time. Like, like when we do a Florida run, man, if you didn't get your, your draw, right. Like, yeah, you might not get that in your check. Yeah. And sometimes you get a $200 draw and, and you, you'd owe them 50 bucks, 50 more. bucks. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Literally like you're not just making that up because right. you've gotten a check like that before. And I, I have absolutely two. several times yeah. you know, when you're running smaller markets or territories that weren't doing that well, you, you'd dread it because you can take a $200 draw and you'd owe them 50 bucks, you know, 50 bucks back. Now, a lot of times you got paid for like 10 straight shows. So, you, you know, you never had to write them a check or anything. Right. It, it, it wouldn't be coming J out. Jake Roberts showed me a check one time and I thought Jake was making big money. You know, I was, I was, wasn't really involved at that time. And Jake showed me a check where he actually owed the office like $750. And I, <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. You know, that uh, I couldn't believe how it worked, but that's how it was. Oof. You know what was yeah. amazing during that time? I mean, you had you and Kane there. It's just you were the one, two, three kid. He was Isaac Yankum. You had Scott. You had Kevin. You had Triple H. You had Stone Cold. Yeah, you had everybody there. Yeah. It was just not all the ingredients. That the, yeah, you had all the ingredients. Yeah. It was amazing that you didn't have that. That's, that could have been the greatest roster of all time. Yeah. And we yeah. weren't selling any tickets. We didn't like we weren't the the right way. We weren't yeah. showing the pot the right way. Yeah, I didn't like our show. I mean, I was grateful to be there and I loved that, but like I wasn't a fan of our product at the time, to be honest with you. So when you went down to when you finally ended up jumping with, with Scott and, and Kevin, yeah, what did you think when you got down there? I mean, you you left WWE, you, you went down there, and then all of a sudden we've got this war coming. What did you think? Hey, so um you know, I was used to the way things were done. Like, you know, you can say whatever you want about WWE at the time, but they were always organized, you know, and like you knew where you were going, like you knew what was going on. Like um, that was the thing. Things were great down there in a lot of ways, but it was very disorganized. Um, but like, honestly, you got like, that was a good thing in a way, because like you could get like they couldn't stop you from getting over like they like it was you know um it was just like like free reign like just go out there and, and do what you wanted and that you was know? the best thing uh, for your career because you went yeah. from being a one two three kid who's kind of this underdog who's fighting underneath to being this edgy smart ass yeah we you're terrific at because you're a smart guy and able to, and able to be able to have that banter that you can actually get your yeah. own heat yeah but man, it was so big, you guys. Um, like just this, that whole like, you know, like the way that NWO thing blew up, and then me, and then all of a sudden being a part of it, and I was like, wow, because you know, like, okay, I got to be the one, two, three kid, and like that gave me more notoriety than I'd ever had. And, but this was like, 
times 10. It was crazy. Yeah. Did you guys think at that time, because I mean, we had a bunch of people on here, you know, we were all, we were all part of that Monday night war. I, I didn't know, I, you know, I, I thought Vince would probably win, but I wasn't sure. Did you guys think when you're guys down there, you're making a ton of money, you guys are killing it in the ratings. Did you guys think that WCW would come out on top at that time? Not like, okay, they're going to put W they're not going to put Vince out. Like, like, I never once thought for a second that, okay, we're going to drive Vince out of business. Like, and it was anything that I wanted, wanted to happen. You know, like I honestly thought that at some point I was going to be back, which obviously happened, you know? Um, so were a lot of the guys in the locker room thinking we're going to, we're going to end up on top yeah, of this war. Yeah. That, that maybe, maybe had not worked in WWE or, or yep. whatever we're buying, we're drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah. Yeah. And I understand why, because it was like a juggernaut, right? Like, and then it's week after week after week of, you know, yeah. you know, winning in the ratings or whatever. Like, and a lot of times it wasn't close either. I mean, you right. guys were blowing us away. So you guys had the talent down there, and uh, you know, but uh, I, I, I liken it to uh, you know, you guys were a TV company, and Vince at that time was still a wrestling That's company. Right. You know, and he focused on that wrestling, and uh, and it started building the stars. You know, like he's capable of doing. You know, and it was a blessing because. The winners of it all was the fans because that competition between the two. I mean, both products got so much better during that time, but the fans won that won that battle. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, damn it, I had a point I was gonna make. Uh, man, I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> join the club. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Join, <laughs> join the club. We'll all soon be hunting Easter eggs we just hid. But until then, <laughs> we're gonna have a good time. <laughs> So there that time, that's when uh, bef- <laughs> that's when you, uh, you got fired by FedEx, right? And yeah. then and then you were deciding whether to go back. Were you still were you really deciding thinking about going back to WCW? No. Or WWE did was that was WWE pretty much the only option you were thinking the, at the time? Well, okay, pretty much. But so when the negotiations started happening, like WWE WWE leaked the offer they sent me and they really lowballed the shit out of me on the offer and put it out there in public. And it was the only thing that almost made me say, fuck you. I'm going back because like there was a certain amount of money that like I was going to not, I wasn't going to go for any, any less. And I ended up going for a little bit less than that, that number that I put in my head, but I got some other perks in lieu of that, that they probably wish they hadn't have given me. Because I got to, I got them to give like okay, 180 days a year, but you can only work me 15 days a month, so you can't run me into the ground, and like and then I like you know then I told all my friends that's what I got, and then they wanted it too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so like anyways, um, yeah, but the truth is, um, John, like. Paul called me and like laid that whole, like, you know, Hey, Sean's going to be out. And like, you know, we want to keep DX going. And man, I just knew regardless that I didn't want to not be a part of that because I knew it was going to blow up. I really did. You know, well, especially yeah. if I, especially if I was coming in with some of that NWO clout still attached. Did you have any worry about it? Because I mean, like, we're, it's like trying to replace uh, animal or Hulk, you know, they tried that a couple of times. It didn't, yeah. you know, it's like replacing any great team. You know, you're taking out Sean Michaels because of injuries. He was going to be gone. Yeah. Even though he, he was around a little bit, he was gone and trying to put something in that place. Did you have any hesitation? Like this might not work. No, because the thing is, is we didn't put someone in his place. I came in to my own place. I didn't take, I didn't try to become what Sean was for DX. I was just me. And, and, you know, I had, I, I I never once thought of it like that. You know, like I never felt like I was trying to fill anybody's shoes. Um, It was just like, you know, even if Sean was still there, that would have been a spot for me if I was coming back. It just was natural. Right. 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 Because of all of our relationships. Yeah. And Sean and Hunter, I mean, they, they became massive stars pretty much on their own. I mean, they, they yeah. just started doing all this. They were they were as entertaining as two people had been. And yeah. Billy and and, and uh, Road Dog, I mean, those guys were. I mean, they were 
they were below mid card prop. I guess you would say our mid card. I don't know if they. Yeah, but, that's not fair. About where I was. <laughs> yeah, but they were, but they were getting traction, right? And they right. like oh the people goodness. were starting oh, to get with yeah. them, and yeah. yeah, it was it was perfect. It was um, and we all man, we all just gelled once we all got together. Was I had a great relationship with Ryan, anyways? Uh, prior to that, and Billy too. Like Billy and I, Billy and Bart and I, like we started at the same time for Vince. You know, and we, we worked a ton with each other, you know, when they were the guns and stuff like that. And just, man, it all just felt so right, you know, and like everything, like so much of that stuff that happened organically, you know, is like, I think just what, you know, what really cemented us with it. With, I remember know, the, the night I was, I was there the night that uh, Road Dog and Billy started tagging up. And, you know, they, they were just, they weren't really being used by anybody. They've been tried a different, you know, a couple different characters, a couple different iterations. Rockabilly, like, you know, yeah, Je- right. Road Dog, the real Jesse James. Yeah. Or, right. Road Dog is just as entertaining. The road, and roadie you know, and all that stuff. As any human being alive, he really went out there with an open mic and they just didn't care. They could yeah. just say whatever you want. And he went out there and he was the Road Dog that we saw in the back. Uh-huh. And people went nuts over him. And then they they became you know one of the biggest tag teams of all time through through that entire thing. Hey, but John, like, John, I, John, John, yeah. it, 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 it's amazing, John. I think hit on a point there. You know, a guy's personality in the back. A lot of times, you know, their personality in the ring is is, is completely opposite. But when they're able to do what Road Dog and, and some of the you guys did, bring that personality and put it in the ring. That becomes them. That is them. That's who you're seeing. And that's the reason they're so entertaining in the back, you know, because yeah. once they make that projection and they tie the two together. But Road Dog, Road Dog, I mean, everybody was around him backstage. So yeah. when he went out, everybody listened to him. That's it's weird. They, it's funny you say that too, because like this his brother Brad was 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 like that. He was a character yeah. in the back, but he couldn't bring it to the in front of the camera part, right? Like right. Brad, right. one of the greatest, right? Yeah, and he was. Like, he was just, to me the greatest. Yeah. Yeah, and and that, but like, um, I don't know, man. Sometimes we get out there in front of the camera, and it's just really hard to be hundred percent authentic. Right. You know, like it's it's weird. Like, um, uh, yeah. Well, I think so part I, of it is, you know, when, when we broke in, you had a certain mindset of being a wrestler. Yeah, And, you know, the, the funny stuff in the back rarely ever translated to what was in front. You know, a guy like Murdoch right. would do some crazy stuff, but that was, he was different. You know, most of the guys were just, they were wild and crazy in the back, but they always had a certain stick. You know, it was always uh-huh. his, his brother. And the Attitude Era allowed guys to be themselves, one of for the first time. And when guys that made it, made it because they were able to figure out how to take that camera down and just be themselves, which... The guys we saw in the back were just people don't realize during Attitude Era, yeah. the dressing room was just as entertaining as the show. Oh, yeah. We yeah, had yeah. some funny, funny guys there. <laughs> yeah. stuff, the hijinks that would go on, the the banter was, I mean, it was world class. Yeah, you know, like that era, like like when I think of that, and I think it, you know, every time I see you and Jerry, like on a tweet or something and doing the show, like it brings me back to the time I'm I'm, I'm in a dressing room and all of a sudden I hear this screaming. But it's like not just screaming; it's yeah, it's it's laughing too. Like it's like this agony, and and also like can't stop laughing. And I turn the corner, and there's this stack of gym mats stacked up, and Jerry's got you. It looks like he's got you, like in like an abdominal stretch, like all just stretched out on here. And you're, I mean, no, you can't help. Like you got snot coming out of your nose. You're laughing and you're crying, and it was just, I, it just that. It's ingrained in my head forever. Every time I think of you two guys. <laughs> That's where you come up with that stupid phrase, tap like you mean it. <laughs> what yeah, happened, Brad what happened, me like this. this. You hit me like this. Like, come on, John, <laughs> tap like you mean it. <laughs> the, day, the night before, I won't tell the whole story, but the day before I jumped Jerry and I got him pinned up against the fence and I wouldn't let him up. He bag jumped me, Sean. He bag jumped so Remember, saw your, saw your Brown, saw your Brown was playing the pre-show in Greensboro and I was yeah. walking out to the ring while everybody was watching rehearsal and, and a sucker texts me and bag jumped me. Yeah, and I got it. I would have to back jump you too. I got him stuck down by the fence, and I won't let him up. And Sawyer Brown quits doing their performance. He goes, "Sorry, guys, we got to stop. Looks like somebody's getting their ass whooped." <laughs> <laughs> Jerry was so mad. Uh, the next day, he sends out for shoes and shorts, and he wants to meet me in the ring. 
I said, hell no, I ain't beating you in the ring. You got to work on this one. So he calls me into an office. And it's him and Pat and right. Jerry sitting right across from me. And Jerry, as he, st- I realize in hindsight, he takes off his glasses, he takes off his watch, and he's. Oh, he does the take off the watch gimmick, huh? Yeah. And he's chewing me out. He goes, John, you got, you can't have horseplay like that. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm an old shooter. You got to respect. Finally, I said, Jerry, I'm just fooling around, and I don't look my head. And when I did, he bum rushed me. <laughs> and he bum rushed me. That's why I ended up by those mats. <laughs> he was on he was one one of those folded chairs and he was rocking back and forth. And I said, Man, if I time this or just right, I can oh. take his ass. And I had my feet stuck <laughs> in the chair. It just right, just as he was going back, man. I got him. <laughs> no, it was great. <laughs> and so Jerry's got me, and, and I realize I'm about to be choked unconscious. And he goes, You better tap, you Texas pussy so, okay jerry okay and i went just like that little that he goes no you gotta it. cap like you mean it <laughs> but that's how it was we just had a ball back oh, yeah. we worked our ass off so much you know i mean you had to have some little relief backstage and we had a group of guys who, who knew that and 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 contributed to it so it, it was it wasn't all work <laughs> Hey, Jerry, you were telling you were mentioned that yet Pete gas on, uh, I don't know, last week or, or recently. Yeah. And, um, man, like that's still one of the greatest segments ever. Like you probably talked about it like yeah. at length, yeah. but man, you know, obviously it was one of the highest rated segments ever, right. if not the, yeah. but like just the, the people just, I mean, just ate it up, man. I felt so happy for you guys, you and Pat out there, man, Thank I you. got goosebumps thinking about that too. <laughs> It was fun, and Pete, Pete told us, Sean, you know, what 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 uh, a valuable uh, mentor you was to him, and uh, that you took him, you took him aside and gave him a lot of advice during that run, which he said I needed so much, and I had to have a guy like Sean Waltman, next guy, come up to me and tell me tell me what I'm doing wrong and tell me some suggestions. Really meant the world to him. I want you to know that. So. But like, I'd like to be like that anyway, just because like. People told him, like, we're like that with me. Uh, but also, like, he's involved in my stuff. Like, he's in my program. Like, he's, he's with Shane, and, like, he's involved in my matches. So it, it behooves me right. to smarten him up, right? Like, right. that's how, like, a lot of guys have gotten smartened up over the years was they end up working with someone great, and, like, that guy has to smarten them up so they don't fucking make them, oh, excuse my language, don't make them look bad. Yeah, and then that's one of the things that uh, the, the Mean Street Posse fit right in with everybody. Right. You know, they came in that had no background of going through the territories. The guys all loved them. And they were real good, humble. They were good guys. They are real humble. And, um, and, and I also, I remember being concerned that maybe there might be some resentment. And, like, I didn't want them, to, like, I, like, I want them to feel welcome, honestly. Like, I like those guys. And they brought, like, they, they brought something to the table. They did. They certainly did. They they, they yeah. were they were they were they were they were undersold uh, 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 faction at that time, and Shane Shane needed them, and I think they helped Shane's growth uh, to what he become by oh, being yeah. a part of that. Oh yeah, and they they like they really helped dress up that match that I had with Shane at WrestleMania 15, and you and Pat too. Uh, well, uh, that you, was you so and much Pat, fun. I hope I didn't potato the shit out of you, Jared, because I hope uh, you did. And oh, you probably did, look, and I loved it. Oh, uh, but when I look back on it, I'm going, oh, my God, it looks like I just killed Pat and Jerry. Uh, <laughs> it was right on my entrance. They came well, which, which time? <laughs> 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 that was the thing that, that I loved. But Pat, Pat didn't like so well. But, you know, you guys didn't treat us like we were 55 and 56. Everybody was striving to get over. You know, you got to understand. Everybody wanted to get over, so. We, we were looked at it when you looked across the ring, we were just two more guys you had to go through and you weren't going to yeah. work with us any different, you know, than you was anybody else. Mind the bumps might all not been there, but uh, as far as laying it yeah. in and making it believable, man, everybody brought it. And that's what, yeah. uh, that's what, that's what got Pat and I over because we took all that crap. You know? Yeah. Wow. You know, one thing, Sean, that I've, I've told many, many times on many interviews was when you would hit a guy in the corner, chop a guy, and then do that spin kick. Yeah. And I, I've always compared it to got other guys who would throw reckless kicks. You know, the worst thing in the world is when you come off the ropes and somebody has to put up, you know, your hands like this because you have no idea where they're going to hit you. You know, I'm not going to break your nose, your eye. You always would hit it right here on the, on the jaw. You know, sometimes a little snug, most of the time not. 
but you never had to put up your hands. And then there's a, there's a real art to that, to be able to do that and not have to have a guy, you know, just throw up his hands because they're, you're so reckless. I, you know, that's one of the reasons why I used the corner for that, John, is it's like a bullseye. It's like a, um, like having a sight, like and being able to aim. Like if I was just standing in the middle of the ring, I could still hit it. And I've done it a bunch of times, but like, there was something about being in the corner that helped me, that helped me, uh, you know, get that kick right in the, in, in the right spot. And, and I very, very rarely ever missed that. Like when I started oh. missing it here and there, I quit doing it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It makes such a difference to not have to put up your hands and be worried about, you know, getting your head knocked off. And, to, and John, those were the things that like helped me. That was, those were my equalizers in there with guys like you. Cause like I, I did have some offense you could sell. Right. You know, the other thing we had kind of in common was uh, when, when Ron was getting ready to retire, I turned heel on Ron. Yeah. You know, I never had a match with him. We didn't want to have a match. You know, we, we said, we don't want to end up in an angle period. When we're done, we're just done. But Ron did me, a, he created JBL, you know, because of, the association I have with Ron, you do the same thing for Triple H. You know, when he turned heel on you, you realized it only made oh, sense yeah. him turning heel if he did it on you. Oh yeah, that I'm glad you brought that up. You know, because that goes along with the 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 Shane match from WrestleMania 15. Because months before that, Vince brought me in and like sat me down and, and asked me if I would have that match with Shane at WrestleMania, and I was honored. Like. I, at first, I was kind of like, oh, I want to have a match with, the, like, somebody that's been wrestling a while, like, you know. But then, like, immediately it dawned on me, look, this is really good for me. But, like, my thing was, to Vince at the time was, yeah, but I, I'm going over. Like, and he's like, that's fine. And I'm like, and I get to, like, Shane, I have to, I call the shots. Shane has to, um, and he's like, that's fine. And, but the more we were getting down to the match, like, and Paul's telling me, yeah, um, yeah, I'm turning heel and like, it just dawned on me. Like if he doesn't turn heel on me and screw me, his heel turn ain't going to mean hardly shit. Or it's not going to, it's not that it's not going to mean shit. It's just like, how can we get the most out of this? And it was good for me too, man. Cause it martyred the hell out of me. You know, like that was, that, that was what led to me and Kane having that great run. So, you know, um, yeah, yeah, it was good for me too, but, but it, that needed to happen for Paul's turn. Right. That's, that's a lot, of, a lot of people make that mistake sometimes, you know, you, you got to do what deep down makes people go, ah, come on. That, yeah. that wasn't good. Yeah. Not just always turning heel. It's like, ah, that, that's not right. You know, and once you have a friendship like that, invariably that friendship gets broken and somebody turns heel. Yeah. Yeah. So no, it was great for me. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know the, you know, I don't, watch a ton of the stuff that's not WWE. There's so much wrestling on TV today, you know, that it's hard to keep up with WWE and NXT and, you know, and every once in a while I go in and do some commentary. Is there any comparison now between the war of the late 1990s that we were in with modern wrestling with WWE and, and AEW, you think? I mean, I can see some, I can see some parallels, but I mean, geez, just like, it's so much like the whole atmosphere, like the, the, the playing field is so much different. Right. And like, just the, you know, um, you know, the, the, the numbers, like what we considered, you know, like the numbers they get now that they consider good numbers, we would be like horrified. Right. Right. Like, I mean, we were, yeah. We like would think we're losing our job. <laughs> yeah. Like under 2 million views, we'd be like, Oh my God you know, end of the world. But then now like, that's a decent, that's a good number. But, um, uh, I think there, uh, I'm waiting to see. Yeah. I, it's, it's really like an interesting time, like, uh, to be like, to just sit back and watch what's going on. And, and, uh, um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it might be. It, I don't know, John. What do you think? I don't know because it was such a unique time. You know, the, the numbers were different, but TV's different. So it's not yeah. fair to compare ratings, you know, from now to the, you know, 20 years ago because TV was so different. At that time, we had a head to head live show 
that was pretty much a zero sum game. You know, somebody was going to yeah. win, somebody was going to lose. Yep. There's never been anything like that. That's like another NFL league starting up and saying, Hey, we're going to go against you guys on Monday night. And by the way, that's our only show. And we're going to, one of us is going to go out of business. I mean, that, I don't think there's ever, ever going to be anything like that again, as far as that part of it. Right. Now, as far as the, the attrition to survival, I see, I could see some type of parallel, but not as far as, I mean, that was a huge stakes game being yeah. played at the time. Hey, John, do you remember like the, there being this much tribalism in, in the fan bases like back then, like WCW, uh, WWE? Like, I don't know if, I, I mean, obviously it was there and like people had their favorites, but like, man, it's just gotten so bad. Like the, the yeah. how toxic, like the people have gotten over that. Yeah, you know? I, don't, I don't know if it's because fans have such a voice and maybe it's a smaller minority than what we think and they're just more vocal than because they're they, they're able to be on your phone yeah you, you pick up your twitter and it, it comes from a bunch of people well maybe it's like maybe it's 10 people that have 50 followers you don't know uh -huh. you, know, you don't know if that represents a broader but no i didn't think the tribalism was that bad back then you know we i didn't either i didn't either i've never seen so much passion nowadays with with the fans that they have I mean, they actually have more passion i think than than the talent to who you know towards the product yeah. there and and uh that's the big difference I know. And, and I think it's a very toxic uh, atmosphere yeah. out there. And I didn't feel that at all. I mean, we all hated WCW. I mean, uh, to get right down to it. You know, I, I made a statement. If I'd seen Eric Bischoff, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have wanted to kick his <laughs> ass. You know, that's what cop a job he did, right. you know, get, get, yeah. getting that way. But, you know, nowadays you, you, I, I don't feel that way towards anybody else, but, there, there was some heat, but it wasn't toxic like it is now. And you know what was, if there was some toxicity within the fan, fan base, like the one that, where I noticed it really, not between WWE, WWF fans and WCW fans, but WCW fans versus NWO fans, all in the, yeah. all, on, all in the building, like, the WCW and NWO fans had a big like riot with each other in Canton, right. Ohio, one time. Yeah. Like yeah. hooligans in a soccer stadium. Yeah, yeah, like a like a European yeah. soccer match there. But what what I what I see now too, and I and I hear a lot of it, uh, that that the fans realized that they were the the benefactor of 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 that war, war there, and so I I think they they take a lot of pride because they they saw the business just ballooned to yeah. to unreasonable heights at that time and the talent was just man look at the talent that was on both sides during that yeah. time yeah so i think like i would be i wish people would just be grateful for all the great wrestling that's out there now yeah, man I do too, like yeah. going at yeah. each other because back then when, when you have like nwo versus wcw it's kind of like the nascar fans you know they show up wearing their their 34 their sevens their right. threes and stuff and they'll they'll bark at the other fans of so and so, but they're all fans of NASCAR. Yeah, they're just fans of different drivers. You know, I, I felt like that's what it was more back then. Right. You know, now it's good you know, analogy. Now it's different, but you know, our rosters were pretty much <laughs> split with you guys going down to WCW and us staying. We'd all work together. I mean, all the guys have been in territories together. You know, and then all of a sudden now we're at war with each other. But it wasn't like the boys had a lot of animosity toward each other. We had yeah. that animosity toward the company itself, the hierarchy and all that stuff. Yeah. The boys didn't. Yeah. And like, I, I, you know, when we did, when we invaded the, the nitro that time, you know, the DX right. thing, yeah. like I wondered, like, cause we never thought about, Hey, if any of the boys were going to be pissed, right. Like any of their roster, because, you know, we were friends with like so many of them guys, but like, I come to find out maybe there was a little bit of resentment, like with some of the guys, like, and I guess I can understand that maybe like, how would you feel like, like if WCW like showed up, you know? Well, to, we just had, to, we had an example of it, Sean, when ECW showed up and nobody, everybody was stupid and didn't inform the town of what was going on in the back. I mean, that, that oh, could have been a, yeah. a serious, serious night. Yeah. That was going to be a fight. Yeah, they That's crazy. Up. They didn't yeah. smarten up the boys in the back until after ECW had already made their presence known. The boys were coming out, and they were coming out to fight. Yeah, and there were some guys on that ECW roster that you probably don't want to mess with. Yeah, yeah. It would have been, been a fight. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Bob, 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 and all yeah. There's there a couple of them, you know, that you knew you, you'd have to break. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. You know, I love the, I love the fact, you know, that night that you guys invaded um, WCW. The, the scope in Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. So afterwards, <laughs> uh, they, Jerry came around and told me and Ron, said, hey, would you hang around in the back in the parking lot? Because we don't know if WCW is coming over to invade us. So we hung around, I looked around, Jerry had told the Blues Brothers and Shamrock and Blackman and stuff. And we're sitting out there thinking, you know, if Haku shows up, we're going to send out Shamrock and we're going to watch the history of the world. <laughs> they may be fighting 10 years from right? now. And hope the cameras are rolling. <laughs> oh, yeah. But what a great, what an incredible time. Because, you know, we didn't know either. You know, we, we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, we were, guys were invading each other's live show and it was a, it was a pretty cool time. Yeah, man. Yeah. I love the fact that you guys had a backup plan. I think it was Sean Selman had an extra uh, video. Yeah. That was my yeah. biggest, that was my biggest concern was not if we were going to get arrested, but like how, if, if shit goes down, how do we get the, the, the tape, the video, you know, keep it in our custody, you know? Cause I mean, it would have been all for nothing if we didn't have that. Right. That was such an incredible time for you guys to do that because it was just something you guys did i mean and yeah. i was it was planned it was everything was you know obviously you're in not planned that well i mean it was a half big <laughs> <No>. plan man <laughs> i love like, I, I saw an interview you did and i didn't realize this at the time when you guys were in, in new york one time shooting fireworks and stuff that was just because the tape show had a 10 yes. minute short and they told you guys just go do something yeah and we just walked out through new york city and just acted like fools <laughs> <laughs> and it was yeah when I got the name, uh, or you started using the name Wrestling God, it was because of the same thing. We were backstage, and they said, hey, well, John, we need something to celebrate. Oh, we, need, we, need, we need to kill about four or five minutes. We're going to send a camera crew back here. Celebrate your win. So I got Doug Basham there, and he's going, you're, you're, you're a god. I go, yeah, I'm a god, I'm a god, I'm a god. He goes, you're a wrestling god. I'm a wrestling god. That's how <laughs> it came about. But back then, stuff just happened because we were told we need four or five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. John, you brought up a wonderful time uh, we used to have there in between shows sometimes we need to kill some time and we had nothing that you know we didn't want to stick a match out there for three or four minutes so hey John or hey Sean go out and, and entertain the folks it's basically what we told told everybody to do just go out and entertain the folks and some of the funniest stuff I uh, come up I remember oh. Hunter one time was out there for like five minutes He'd say, and he was working the microphone, like the microphone was cutting out on him. He did a whole damn routine like that. And the people were hilarious when it came back. Oh, I used to get told all the time, John, John, we need 10 minutes. Just go do something. I go, okay, send Taker out in about 10 minutes to choke slam me. And so I just sit out there and I just do one thing after another. I try to get Taker to break character. I try to get all this stuff. And the end of it, of course, is choke slam, tombstone, all this stuff. Okay, now we got 10 minutes. Let's go on with the show. Don, man, that JBL thing was one of the greatest heel characters ever, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, and, and just to watch like the growth from, from you know, doing just the, uh, the APA stuff, uh, to then and like just your work as, as, as a great in ring singles guy, dude. That was okay. incredible, man. I had man. so much fun, but I had, I had the best talent in the world to work with. You know, I just, I had so many great guys that that i was able to work with it became so easy you know eddie was the right guy taker and booker and you know all those guys that i had then cena at the very end i mean it was just i had all the right guys to be able to make this heel character hey cena um cena talks about something with you like uh it was a recent interview he did you know do you, you familiar with that I, I saw some clips of it yeah yeah i guess um I guess it was that you dropped the belt. You dropped the belt to him. That's right. Yeah, I dropped his first. And the there first, was something. And there was title, something, Yeah. Apparently, there was something that you said to him, like in that conversation, uh, that that kind of that he learned a lot from. Yeah, you know, it was. I, I think it was me trying to explain to him. Look, I'm trying to become the biggest heel in the world because I want to give you the biggest obstacle in the world to overcome because this is all about you. You know, and that was really my only concern at WrestleMania was I want to make sure and do my part to make him because that was my, that was at that point, that was my job, you know, because yeah. guys did that for me. 
And it wasn't like I was passing the torch. You know, Cena was going to be the guy anyway. I don't want to take any credit for anything he's done. But that was my role at the time was to to make sure and be the biggest heel I could so that I could make him. And I remember, I think I remember kind of the, the conversation of explaining to him that this is why I'm doing this. This is why we're going this way with me because this is all about you. Yeah, man, you set the table for him. Yeah, and I never yeah. dreamed he'd be a 16-time world champion doing all these movies. And, yeah. you know, he he's a wonderful person, a human being. I, I, I think the world of John. He's so respectful. He's so nice. I mean, he, he's the right guy. Yeah. I mean, it just, I just, you know, um, yeah, I just remember when it, it kind of seemed like he was, I don't know if you remember, he used to come to TVs and he would do dark matches and stuff. Most of yeah. the time when we were out in California, man, I don't know. It seemed like they kind of knew he was going to be the guy one day. Like, like I remember Pat looking at him and I just remember like, it, at least it seemed like to me, this guy was going to be a big star one day. You know, yeah, I think, I think they knew right away. Uh, yeah. So Sean, uh, we went out, we been, me and Bruce Pritchard, you remember, you know, Rick Bassman, Rick yeah. Bassman called me and he said, I got a couple of people out there and uh, Victoria was out there. He had, he had, he had a, a roster of really good talent. So uh, I knew Rick from here in Florida. And so I called Bruce and Jr. and I, I told him, "Hey, this guy out there—he's training somebody. He said he got somebody really special out there." So, me and Bruce were spent, uh, sent out to watch Rick's show. We saw him; he was so good and so impressive that we just—we thought it was a one-off type thing. We really did. Yeah. And so, uh, two weeks later, Bruce went back out there and saw him again, and he was identical. Then Bruce and Jr. went out, so he was very well scouted. And, and when we signed him, we just had that feel about the guy. I mean, look who he opened up with. We wouldn't have thought about there against Kurt Angle if this guy wasn't going to be something, you know. But and, right. and boy, did he fill those shoes. Sure did. Yeah, and you know, it's a big difference in a guy going an eight-minute match and a guy going a thirty-minute match. You know, you guys understand that. You know, eight-minute match is easy. You get out there, you you shine the baby face, you get heat, you go home. 30-minute match, you got to take people on a roller coaster. Right. And I remember being out there, I think Cena had done some with Angle first, who's obviously Kirk's one of the greatest of all time. And then he did with me. And I just remember his feel for the business. It was really unusual because when you first take a guy in that 30 minutes, it's kind of, you get in the deep water and you can feel him kind of reaching, you know, just trying to, you know, make sure that he had a feel that was unbelievable. And I remember telling Vince, going this this guy is really good and then saying he's he's not just a bodybuilder he i said nope i said he's he's your guy and and i never dreamed that he would be the you know the guy that he became but i knew he was the guy that had the talent at the time at least to carry that role and of course then he goes on and becomes one of the greatest of all time which he was called the prototype back then and that was a good name for him it really was he was so freaking big and so and so strong you know, he's almost world-class strength, you know, as far as his Olympic lifting. Well, Pac, I want to tell you, we, me and Jerry have been <laughs> looking forward to having you on. And <laughs> this has been a, this has been a treat for us. Yeah. Well, a great time. We, oh. you know, we miss being in car rides and being in bars and talking to guys. And now we do it over zoom drinking uh, uh-huh. non-alcoholic beverages, but <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> <Wanna switch. laughs> You've always been one of my favorites. One of my favorites to work with. You're one of you my too. human beings on the planet. And uh, I can't thank you enough. You're one of the greatest workers I've ever worked with. And I've worked oh, man. for a long time. Um, hey, that means a lot, man. Like respect to, from our peers, man, that, that, right. I mean, obviously the, for the, the, the fans too, but man, there's just something about, you know, when you hear that from, from your colleague, man, it means yeah. the world. And I feel the same way about you, man. Yeah. Sean, you know, we've been around a long time, man. And uh, all through the years, I don't think there was ever a time where we disrespected each other or did trust each other. And I I'm so proud of your growth, man. I, I've watched you become who you are. I've seen you at your lowest point yep. and I've talked to you and I've seen you at your highest point, but, I think right now in life, you seem to be at, at the greatest place Amazing. that you ever been, man. And I, I'm so I'm so proud of you, man. And and what what are you up to? I mean, what what's going on in your life? I just do my show, Pro Wrestling for Life. Oh, okay. Uh, I um I sh- I do these on Tuesday. 
you know. So yesterday I was doing my. I, it's I, a great I show. I'll show. watch some Thanks. of them. I'll have watched some of them. You know, but fast. I watched some of them today, getting ready for the interview. It's a great show. It's just a good. It's got some different segments, some fun segments and stuff. You know. It's, and forgive me for not uh, promoting pro wrestling for life in the intro. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> but Jerry, don't worry, man. Um, Jerry, Jerry, I just you're saying that you saw me in my lowest too, man. And yeah, I remember the time when I broke my neck and you were at the hospital with me. Cause like it, we weren't sure. No one was sure whether I just OD'd or something in the uh, ring or what happened. Uh, right. You know, like I remember you telling me like, yeah, man, I'm almost had to fire you, but you broke your neck, but it was a broken neck. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. 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 So Jerry, yeah, you have seen me at my work, my worst. And, um, and you always still regardless, man, you always dream me like a million bucks, man. And I just love you to death, Jerry. I'm honored, I'm honored to be able to call you a friend, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.